Welcome to the Ag Emerge Podcast, brought to you by Ag Solutions Network. Your farming challenges are unique, so your practices should be too. We're here to share emerging ideas, build connections, and provoke conversation. Get ready to improve your soil, your crops, your livestock, and your family's livelihood. I'm your producer, Kim Chase. And I'm your host, Monty Bottens. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for joining us. Today, we welcome Daniel Pepitone, one of the co-founders of Harp Bioherbicide Solutions, where they have developed a series of natural-based herbicides utilizing plant extracts. It's fascinating how this mode of action works, and as you might imagine, Monty has a great time digging into the specifics. So without further delay, let's get started. Welcome, everyone, to this episode of the Ag Emerge podcast. Today, I'm joined by Daniel Pepitone from Harp Bioherbicide. Welcome, Daniel. Hi, Monty. So so excited to be here. Really appreciate the opportunity to uh, talk more about what we're working on and uh, looking forward to our conversation. Well, this is going to be a mind-blowing conversation, and uh, I've been following what you guys have been up to for a while. Uh, I think I got to bump into uh, Rob Fraley one time, and he was telling me what you're up to, and uh, he's he's one of your directors, but... Don't let me spoil all the fun. Uh, I'm going to let you let you tell everyone, our farmers and our ag technologists that listen to the podcast, who who you are and, and what Harp is all about. Sure. So I'm Daniel Pepitone. I'm one of the co-founders of Harp Bioherbicide Solutions, along with my partner, uh, Dr. Chad Romer. Uh, based on his title, he does the science. I do more of the business end. I try to stay out of his way. I generally don't do a good job of that. Uh, but uh, we're working uh, here in uh, Research Triangle Park, North Carolina, uh, we're, and uh, developing a series of natural-based herbicides. Uh, we uh, utilize plant extracts, and really the compounds that we find in there, our main source for those plant uh, extracts is mint. Um, so we, we take uh, the mint plant extracts, we uh, use different ratios, uh, either of the oils themselves or of the isolated compounds, uh, formulate them and turn them into herbicides. So it's for a while, people have known there's lots of benefits to, let's say, essential oils, you know, so there's various classes of them. And and mint is one of those, right? You know, along with eucalyptus, lavender, all those things. We know there's kind of some natural insect repellency and some health benefits and such. So uh, did you just go down to the local store and said, huh, I think I think this would make a great herbicide. How How did this come about? Uh, certainly. So myself and, and my partner, Chad, uh, we both worked at uh, one of the large uh, uh, ag uh, crop protection companies in the past together and, uh, you know, working on uh, different projects and pieces. We always knew that um, great challenges, as, as I'm sure your uh, listeners and yourself are aware, in terms of weed control, we haven't seen a lot of new uh, innovation, if you will, new modes of action herbicides come out in the last several decades. Um, and that, that has brought on weed resistance. Um, and that weed resistance is probably the biggest challenge a grower may face from an agronomic standpoint in the field. Um, at the same time, we also look at the other sides of agriculture, whether it's uh, organic or regenerative, um, and we don't see a lot of products available for them in terms of uh, herbicides, a lot of uh, hand weeding, machinery, those types of things, because we we sat and we chatted, and uh, uh, he's, uh, he's, he's a really wonderful scientist, and he said, you know, I, I can do this, and I uh, I said, okay, well, go do it. And uh, you let me know how it goes, and then I'll join you. So he spent, you know, he, he left, and uh, he spent several years really you know, putting the parts and pieces together, and that started with um, executing a series of screenings. We went through hundreds of different candidates uh, through a screening process. Um, really, as every true startup should, it started in his house and in, in the kitchen working with a blender. Uh, we still have the blender here in the office, um, mixing things up trying things out till we got to a place where, uh, hey, these these work as herbicides, um, you know, and, and it really became mint, as again, as the lead source that, you know, in combinations of the different extracts, very powerful. The first samples we had in our hands, um, you know, not feasible in terms of price uh, for a grower. Um, you know, we're talking hundreds of dollars per acre, if you, if you will, and, you know, but it worked. Um, and I looked at Chad from the business side and said, you know, we can't go forward given the price. And he said, that's not going to be an issue. I can, I can do this. We can do this and get it down to a place where it fits into uh, the norms of, of what we need it to be. And so we went from there. 
Well, that's a fantastic story. And, and on a funny note, I'm I'm kind of similar. When we developed some of the formulations for Ag Solutions Network early in the day in, in our biofertilizers, I, I still have some of the original vials of of what we originally developed. So that's for the that's for the future museum, right? But no, no, I'm glad, glad you saved the blender. That's a fun story. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna get it bronze. <laughs> Perfect. I hope you can. Yeah. Okay, so just uh, I think I want to talk about the the whole organic regenerative dynamic eventually, but let let's talk a little bit more about the about the material itself. So there's really uh, this works in two ways: as a pre-emergent, and then also as as a post. Um, so uh, I so I assume it's a non-selective uh, type post and a pre. How how are you able to accomplish both? That's rather unique. Yeah, and that and that's exactly right. It goes back to the compounds that we're using. It's uh, non-selective. It's contact herbicide. Uh, we're able through formulation to get it move a few centimeters. What we want to get to is the growing point. Uh, it's not systemic in any way. Uh, but what we see is is wonderful activity, um, and, and that's because it's it's different. Um, you know, the herbicides that are out on the market today, the synthetic ones, are enzymatic in their approach. It's sort of a lock and key mechanism. They target a certain binding site, they turn something on or off, and the weed dies, or in the case of a pre-emergent, um, the, uh, the seed germinates and it's able to get in there and do the kind of the same activity. Mm -hmm. uh, what's different about the compounds that we're using uh, is that it is completely uh, physiological, uh, meaning it's, it's not enzy enzymatic at all, uh, but what it does is uh, attacks uh, either weed or seed in the ground from a physiological perspective in that it makes the cellular walls uh, of the plant tissue um, fluid. So it cannot hold on to, let's say, water anymore. Uh, the organelles lose their ability to function and hold on to whatever they're going to produce, uh, whether it be uh, ATP from a mitochondria or um, you know, something along those lines. Um, and so once the, the once the harp gets in there and you know, disrupts these functions, makes the uh, uh, the plant uh, cellular walls fluid. Uh, you know the the functionality of of the uh, weed stops and it wilts, dies, and it happens pretty quickly. Hmm. So um, more along the speed of a gramoxone than a speed of a glyphosate, I would assume, because it's it's essentially it's kind of a cell wall disruptor, but it's it's not right. Correct. Those more tear them apart, if you will. Right. So we're not doing that, and, and that's what makes us really different modes of action because multiple things are happening at uh, different locations and you know, slightly different ways uh, to get the outcomes that we're looking for. Mm -hmm. um, and so what we see is the ability to use it as a pre-emergence, mm -hmm. uh, given that we're using uh, plant extracts, the formulations are somewhat oily in, by nature, obviously, um, that allows us to make an application. And that application will work and stay within the top two centimeters of the soil. So it's not gonna move through the soil profile uh, again, even if we you know have a large uh, rain event, it's going to stay in that top two centimeters. It's going to spread left to right. And as soon as it comes in contact with the seed, uh, it'll prevent germination. We can actually get through the seed coating, uh, given the properties of these compounds, and prevent germination from happening. Slightly different than, uh, I'd say, virtually all of the pre-emergent products we have out there today. We've got to wait for germination to occur. Uh, then the activity happens. We're preventing that activity from the begin, or pre preventing that germination from the beginning. Um, so it really allows us, uh, you know, quick action in the soil. Half-life is actually pretty short, which is wonderful from a uh, stewardship environmental perspective. Um, but once we come in contact, uh, those seeds are not going to be able to develop. Uh, okay. Kind of similar. Go ahead. So, wow, that, th there's there's some really, really big things in there in what you're saying. Uh, that That's exciting. So the half-life, can, can you share what that is? Uh, yeah, excuse me. It's, it's about 14 days. Wow. Uh, no, Okay. Uh, so it's, again, very quick, and, and that's why you don't, you know, people ask, so what's the residual? Well, we don't need to hang out in the soil and wait for germination to right. occur, right? So okay. we take some of those factors away because of the science that's happening. Um, and so we're, we're fast acting, get in there and kind of, you know, get done. Uh, again, deeper seeded weeds, we're not going to get there. We're staying in that top layer. So again, you're able to use partner chemistries, if you will, or if you need to. Um, and so that's, that's really how it works in that pre-emergence level. But you said the the first one to two centimeters, so yeah. roughly a half inch to uh, you know three quarters of an inch. Yeah, probably um, about so that half inch, yeah. 
Okay, so now farmers, uh, think about this. Like he was saying, if you if you use a metallochlor, acetochlor, uh, dimethanin, all those type of uh, pre-emergence, you, you have to re let the seed germinate. And a lot of these seeds were getting resistance to these chemistries because, for example, uh, I have giant ragweed, and I have the late emerging giant ragweed. Well, the reason I have the late emerging giant ragweed is my history of using acetochlor and metallochlor, and I always knock the the early germinators out, you know, with, with my current. And so I've selected for a population of late germinators. So um, with this, it's basically if in a no-till situation, this is perfect, right? So, it, you know, you leave the seeds on the surface. Uh, the whole issue of uh, creating a seed bank, uh, you know, and especially like water hemp that has one and a half million seeds per plant, uh, and, and then leave them on the surface, harp can come in and essentially sterilize those seeds without even having to germ germinate them. Correct. It's, yeah, exactly. I mean, the best weed to control is the one that, that never grows, right? We want to reduce that seed bank. Um, and, you know, it, it exactly works that way uh, in terms of uh, no-till situations. As long as we're making contact um, and we get the right application, and that's, you know, a lot of the work we're doing now is around formulation so we can get the spread we can get the coverage that we're looking for. Uh, mm -hmm. We stop seeds from germinating. Uh, Ab and it Avid long-term no-tiller myself, and and I think the sun is a great uh, herbicide. You know, if you can leave them on the surface, the seeds on the surface, the sun will radiate them versus plant them, you know, with a tillage right. event. But now this comes through and this really changes things. This is incredible. And, and uh, incorporation, uh, light incorporation certainly helps with a sort of sure. water event uh, mm -hmm. or machinery if, if you're so apt to do that. Uh, much like other uh, chemistries that are used on the market today. And that was one of the, you know, from the very beginning, the concepts of we've got to make this act look, feel like chemistry that we know today. We don't want something that you to keep alive, keep cold, use a different expensive piece of machinery. It's got to fit within agriculture's, the practices that we have today. Uh, so that can be you know, adopted by growers and understood and incorporated whether it's alone on the organic side or in combination with synthetic chemistries to overcome the challenges. Uh, so that was, you know, that was very much from the beginning. Plus with traditional chemistries, you get too much rain, uh, it leaches or it gets diluted out of the soil profile and gets diluted over too much. So then your, your active ingredient available to the seed isn't enough to kill it. Just make it mad and resistant for the future. And then, then the other thing is, is that if you don't get rain, they don't activate, right? So, I think this is a, that's unique too. And the 14 day, we have more and more interest in cover crops. Okay. Yes. And and I've done, uh, 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 you're familiar with Verdict and uh, or the brand name Verdict, at least. The, uh, Very much. And, and that. Uh, so I did some experimenting with that on my farm and I found that my cover crops respond so much better using that chemistry um, that I seed in the fall, you know, after on, on corn compared to acetochlor or metallochlor. And so there's there's long legs on these things that affect, you know, other crops other than corn and soybeans. So if you want more diversity or if you want to plant cover crops in your rotation, uh, this sounds like this could be an even better option. Yeah, we've done a lot of uh, work, especially on, on plant back studies. That's one of the concerns, obviously, is, you know, okay, is this going to reach if, you, if you're if you're pre preventing germination, you're going to prevent germination of, of my crop seed. Um, again, it goes back to where we live in that top, uh, you know, couple of centimeters, half inch, never reaches that that seed point, so it doesn't prevent it. So when you think about that, exactly that that half life that we have, we're in and out of the soil, if you will, pretty pretty quickly, uh, and opens up, a, you know, to your point, a series of different windows of what you can utilize uh, on your farm, whether it's uh, you know, cover crops or, or what else you might be uh, or, incorporating. Or vegetable crops. crops, you know, your your yeah. vines are very sensitive or, right. or some of the peas and those legumes are very sensitive. Brassicas, yeah. all those are very sensitive to herbicides. So that's awesome. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'm loving this. So now um, let's talk a little bit more about the uh, post product uh, that, that you're spraying. Are they the same product? Uh, they are the same in that the active ingredients are generally the same. Okay. Um, you but know, maybe again, carrier it, and, and, and percentages are different. Yeah, it, it, again, it goes back to, right, we have this kind of palette of active ingredients because of what's okay. coming out of the, the mint plants. And um, at the same time, everything that's produced uh, naturally, there is a biorational version version of it that's produced synthetically. 
when they are in nature identical molecules, there's no different. Uh, they act the same. Um, they price generally the same, a little bit cheaper on that synthetic side. But uh, so it really helps set up you know the dynamics of of the markets. Uh, but from a post-emergent side, um, we depending on if you're using it alone or in combination with certain chemistries, the the makeup of those compounds may change. Um, and, and but to your point, it very much is also the ratios amounts of the different molecule sets that are in there that we need to get that activity. Um, when we use it in combination, whether tank mix or we've made premixes as well, they are really sort of what we call them very tailored formulations because what works well in combination with one synthetic chemistry is, is different uh, than say another. And we're trying to fill gaps and get the best out of both chemistries. And I think that's something else that's unique about uh, HARP, and, and you've touched on a little bit, but talk about the modes of action. So most of us think of one branded thing, and it's got one molecule in it that's the primary mode of action, and it has this site target, okay? And then yep. when we go out and we get a branded product like an Acuron, all, all that is is just three different ones blended together in a in a tote, right? It's it's atrazine and... and um, Hornet and, or whatever else is in it, you know, um, this harp is a different way of thinking because there's multiple site actions within that molecule itself. You, you, you mind diving into that yeah. a little bit? Yeah. And so if you think about Acuron, right, why would you put all those parts and pieces together? It's because you need those different activities to control, control different weeds in different ways mm -hmm. exactly because of the enzymatic type target site approach. So when we think about the compounds that are in HARP, um, they work differently. And they're working at a series of locations, a series of sites. Anything that has a cellular wall structure, we are going to uh, disrupt the activity there and make it fluid. So again, very, very you know, multiple sites. It's not one. Uh, it's anything that has a cellular structure. Um, so again, multiple sites, multiple modes of action, because it's doing different things to different parts, so, somewhat similar in terms of making those uh, uh, the cellular walls the, uh, and membranes fluid. But all this is happening at one time uh, to a, a plant or a seed, uh, and it really is you know, devastating uh, to that uh, target. And that goes along with the fact that one of the things on your website you emphasize, which is really important, is no known resistance. Correct. We haven't seen any resistance. Uh, we do see some types of weeds that are a little bit more challenging to overcome. Um, certainly grasses, uh, given just their their nature. Uh, you know, we've got to get to the growing point to be able to uh, stop uh, a weed. But you know, grasses will have multiple growing points. Right? So we got to you know their architecture a little bit you know, all just uh, to, to control. Uh, and then you have a series of weeds that may have a. Uh, a slightly thicker cuticle, or when we've got to penetrate that, uh, things like ivy. Those are those are the tougher things to kill. Everybody has those same types of challenges, but no, uh, no known resistance. We haven't seen anything. Uh, we've got about sixty plus different weeds that we've confirmed control of for grasses uh, as well as broadleaf, uh, including twenty five uh, different uh, resistant herbicides, including non target site herbicides and that's or non-target site resistant weeds and that really is sort of the, the next grand challenge evolution of weed resistance we're moving from that target site to non-target site we're able to overcome uh that non-target site resistance where we see a, a, a kosher weed that we got from kansas that is truly metabolizing each and every chemistry that it gets sprayed with um either alone at a certain rate or in combination uh, with chemistries as well to kind of overcome that that resistance issue. Kosha is amazing. I I call it Roundup Ready. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's pretty it's wild. A, yeah, it, it's amazing how it's adapted. And then also we have the uh, Palmer amaranth, and uh, there's several in there. You know, really our biggest resistance challenges are these uh, broad leaves with the you know waxy high pH leaves, a small small. Their, their problem with being able to intercept and, and the chemistry. And then, like you said, then we've selected for ones that can just metabolize, process, use use the herbicide as a fertilizer, you know? <laughs> yeah, you, you kind of you do nothing more than perhaps make it a little angry. Um, but we do see the same, whether it's water hemp that's resistant, pigweeds uh, that, that are resistant, uh, ryegrass uh, that says the non-target site resistance here in North Carolina. 
we're, we're able to, to get the control we're looking for. And again, in our solo products, you're going to use a higher rate because they got to carry the full load. Uh, and we do see enhancements uh, in combination chemistries where we're able to reduce uh, you know, the amount that we uh, uh, need to apply. So now here comes the question. Uh, is there the ability to have a uh, GMO variant of commercial crops that would then be harp resistant? Uh, in the future, yes. And so we are working on that now. Um, as you mentioned, uh, you know, Rob Fraley, uh, former... Uh, I figured that uh, why he might be on the team for a reason. Yeah, he's one of our <laughs> board directors, and that's exactly uh, the, one of the main uh, reasons he's, uh, he's part of our team and helping guide uh, is the herbicide tolerance development. Uh, we're working with a company called Solus uh, AgriScience out of St. Louis. Um, they they work for a similar company that Rob did in the past, and they've created their own uh, you know approach to this. And we've already seen uh, first confirmations of tolerance uh, with our trait packages uh, in uh, our model uh, plant Ceridopsis. So it it is there. It's possible. It's going to take a you know some extended time. We're, you know obviously we're focusing our first efforts on, on getting the chemistry right because we need the chemistry to, in order to to uh, work and work well in order for the tolerance to be there. But the tolerance is there. Uh, again, these are uh, a little bit different uh, approach because everything is physiological. Uh, so it's, it's a, again, groundbreaking science from that perspective. Um, but we're going to continue those efforts. Uh, we have about five uh, different uh, trait campaigns that we're working on, and uh, we're going to rifle through them. We're up to the working on the second and third ones now uh, since we had that uh, first confirmation. The Ag Emerge podcast is brought to you by Ag Solutions Network. The ASN team is hands-on, digging in and invested in regenerative agriculture. Along with the proper plant nutrition and biologicals to boost your soil microbiome, we provide the ideas and implementation guidance to support you on your soil health journey. So stop farming the same way and contact Ag Solutions Network today at asn.farm. The dollars it takes to do this, oh my goodness! Yeah, it's, it's and because you the, know, and, it's the time horizon too. Well, exactly, and and that's why we're going to do this to a point. We are not a genetic seed company. That's not who we are whatsoever. Uh, you know, we're working at we're a technology company working on this new uh, mode of action bioherbicide, and that really is our focus. But uh, you know, we can prove out to a certain point uh, that the herbicide tolerance is there. Uh, the next company uh, can take that and with their own, you know, proprietary germplasms and all the parts and pieces that they have and do wonderfully well can then advance that in a way that we we simply can't. But uh, it'll still be important for you to get the herbicide out there and oh. demonstrate efficacy on a commercial, you know, d demonstrate customer willingness to purchase. Correct. Uh, absolutely, that is that is our number one goal is getting into the marketplace, uh, demonstrating the. Uh, the opportunity uh, across agriculture, whether it's uh, home and garden uh, for general consumers to replace uh, what they're using today uh, around their homes, families, pets, uh, to organic agriculture who does not have the tools uh, required to today to really control herbicides in an effective manner, uh, to conventional acres with the ability to overcome uh, these resistance challenges that we're seeing. Animal safety. And uh, as far again, as, so, let's say insects even or or yeah. um, four legged two legged critters, uh, yeah, so, you know, six foot tall two legged critters. Well, what do we what do we see? Is it not going to be the next uh, round of commercials? Oh, did you use harp herbicide and you have uh, you know lung disease? Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I would say quite the opposite, right? So we think about what we're utilizing. We're utilizing what's inside mint plants. Mm -hmm. uh, it is um, exactly. The same thing, uh, and I, I hope you did today, if you brushed your teeth, that had a minty flavor. Um, it is no different than what makes the mint that's used in mouthwash and toothpaste, uh, in medicinal products like, you know, Vicks Vapor Rub that you, you know, we come in contact on a daily basis. Um, the active ingredients are exactly the same that go into that, go into our herbicide. So from a, you know, a, a human health, uh, animal health safety perspective, um, everything that we start with in terms of our active ingredients live on what's called the 25B list from the EPA, uh, which means it already has uh, approval to go into the marketplace. We don't need to go through further FIFRA approval. Uh, 
uh, and get it regulated anyway. EPA says, great, you can take these, um, these active ingredients and move out into the marketplace. Uh, as an example, there's already one uh, product out that uh, uses one of our core uh, compounds, and that's menthol, uh, in a product uh, that is used to control varroa mites uh, in pollinator colonies. So again, we're talking about things that are, you know, generally regarded as safe and uh, set to go uh, to go forward. Yeah, so if it's generally regarded as be safe. That should keep folks happy, yeah. and I'm, I'm glad to hear that. So the, talk a little bit, if you would, just briefly let people know that you mentioned the 25B list with EPA. So there's there's a list that of stuff we know that's safe, and then there's a list of stuff that we know is not, and then there's the there's a list in between, a huge thing that we don't know, but then requires a lot of testing to make sure that it is. And why, why that's so important that you started with that and what that does for the time frame and scale for your company by, by being on that 25B list. Yeah. As you know, as we sat around a table discussing, okay, what, what do we want to develop in advance of the marketplace? There were, you know, I would say two really important drivers, you know, there, there's a series of criteria you got to meet to have a functioning product, ad adaptable product in the marketplace. Uh, but two that we focused on were natural, um, that we wanted to, you know, take that from the beginning, uh, and then also looked at regulatory and what was, what was easier uh, to get, you know, out into the market from a regulatory perspective. Um, and so we actually, you know, started with that 25B list and what's on there, um, and looking through that, and, and that's where you know Chad did a lot of his screening works was was off of that list, and and, and it was like okay, these again are, are working, and what that allows us to do is the twenty five B formulations. We just need state level approval to be able to begin uh, the sale process, and those are going to be the first products. Uh, we're finishing up those formulations right now, and start looking for partners to bring that to the marketplace. Um, once we get into you know our more advanced formulation, we get off those EPA list. We have a series of uh, what changes is inert surfactants, adjuvants in those formulations that are still EPA approval. Uh, they're still organic, uh, you know, if you will, OMRI approved uh, that we, that, but those need uh, EPA approval, which you go through the process, the timeline. So it certainly helps tremendously, especially from a startup perspective that we have this kind of fast first, you know, products to the marketplace with 25B allows us, you know, to sustain and go forward as we go through uh, the work that needs to be done with EPA to get you know the next the, the set of registrations to to expand uh, what we're doing, and that probably shaves what three years five years off the process. Um, you know, we all Depends. I think we all know, that you know. EPA is a EPA is a little bit of a black box sometimes, right? You get a <laughs> you get and then COVID with, hits and it becomes a blacker box, you know, right? <laughs> you know, so <laughs> exactly, so it's it, it offers you know EPA is essential to us in terms of getting sure. those registrations, uh, but we're not totally relying on that to be able to to function as a company. It's it's incredibly important. Very smart, very smart. Okay, want to talk a little bit about the dynamics in, in the farming world. You know, uh, they, they make some memes about it. You got the conventional farmer and you got the organic farmer and the and the regenerative farmer. OK, so the regenerative and the organic guys kind of kind of hit heads a little bit because the organic says, hey, why are you calling yourself trying to make yourself out to sound like organic? And the regenerative guy is saying, well, why are you tilling all the time? And the organic guy, well, why are you spraying all the time? And they just just butt heads. You realize that. uh you could create a lot of uh, goodwill between organic and regenerative guys because now organic guys can be no or much less tillage because tillage is your primary weed control. And, yeah. and the no-till guys can be a lot less glyphosate, paraquat, uh, you know, these really kind of atrazine heavy hitting uh uh, chemistries. I mean, uh, could, could you bring two really diverse set of farmers together? Well, that's a grand challenge. I don't know if we signed up for that in our, in our business plan. I but think that's I, what you have the opportunity for. I yeah, really but I, and exactly. And I think what you hit on is, you know, what we talk about is they simply don't have the tools that they need. Right. Um, and so if we can bring them unique, new, acting, doing the function, similar to what conventional growers have today, and they have a lot. Uh, of uh, options, some you know, challenged by the weed resistance pieces, but they still have a lot of options in terms of 
for control weeds, you know, we're just the start of the conversation. We're, you know, we're, you know, we're one of the first ones out, uh, if you will, and moving to the marketplace with a bioherbicide. But we've got to get them more than just harp. But if we can get them harp and others come along uh, as well, they suddenly have a portfolio of products that they can use in different ways, create different management plans for different crops, different seasons, different what have you rotations. Um, and function and, fun and function improve their efficiency, improve uh, their their business as they're all business people, um, and improve what they do. And and if and if they you know an outcome is that we can uh, we can see regenerative uh, farmers and organic farmers you know kind of working together and working uh, more harmoniously. Awesome. So what we're after is that weed control. If we can give them the products they need to do that, hey, we're, we're all for it. I honestly don't think an organic farmer looks forward to doing more tillage. I, I don't think that's the most important thing in their life. They do it because they need to, right? To control the weeds. Yeah. And, and no, honestly, I, mean, I don't get a kick out of spraying. Uh, I mean, great. You get to, you know, cover, you know, a hundred acres an hour. That's kind of nice. Uh, and drive fast. You get to look at your crop, but right. I, I don't care to be in the sprayer exposed to stuff and mixing stuff. It, it's, it's not, I don't get any joy out of that. So we'll just just one comment there. I don't think the label says drive fast. So oh oh, oh okay. Well yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, it drive you drive the sprayer much faster than a planter. We'll put it that way. Yeah, no, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, no, but I but you're absolutely right. You know, we're at the end of the day. You know, you have you want to be efficient, whether with time, uh, with money, uh, with what you have to do in your op operation. You know, farmers, as we well know, incredibly important job. Work hard harder than most, if not the hardest job to to do and, and incredibly important. But you have a family, you have friends, you, you want to be able to not do those things as well. How do we improve that is a wonderful selling point for for any technology that, that gets brought to the marketplace. Yeah. And, and I think this is a it's, you know, looking at an application within growing crops in, in the organic with, you know, hooded type sprayers or, you know, this can replace the electric. It can replace the flamers. Uh, you know, a lot of technologies we're doing now uh, in organic will will take out the cash crop, you know, if if things aren't set right or, sure. or those kind of things. So it just gives you a lot more precision and control. It's it's pretty exciting. Yeah, and I, and I think you've done a great point, right? As much as we've got to fit into the agricultural uh, systems we have today, we also think about the future. Uh, the future is undoubtedly going to be more and more precision agricultural driven. Uh, using those technology pieces, and we see them coming, you know, to fruition right now. Uh, so we've developed uh, low volume formulations, uh, specifically for drones, uh, for smart sprayers, uh, to be able to truly reduce um, the amount of uh, total product needed. And I think roughly, I think it is seventy percent or more on any one acre. We don't have to broadcast everything, uh, and I think it's incredibly amazing to think about using a fully natural herbicide. On, and it really then fits into a conventional setting, given the price point. Um, use any uh, use a natural herbicide to really target specific weeds, uh, get the control you're looking for, and, and just improve the efficiency of what we're doing. So the the smart sprayer, uh, some company has uh, labeled it C and spray. There's other people that have called it different things. Uh, so basically, weed identify and spray the weed only type technology. Um, that opens up the door for a higher price point herbicides too. I mean, really, when you think about it, if we're acceptable with spending $35 an acre on a herbicide program per year, you know, just because we're spraying 10% of the land, we still have that kind of in the budget. So, I mean, it does provide margin opportunities for, for you too. Absolutely. It completely changes the dynamics, the equation that we look at uh, in an incredibly beneficial way for us. Um, you know, it also enables growers to protect the existing chemistry that they have, that they can, you know, separate out their management plans in a different way. Uh, we're going to use HARP as our, you know, smart sprayer option for this point in the season. And then we can come back later uh, and use this uh, mode of action or th these modes of action in combination in a, in a in a tank mix for over the top use later in the season. So it really sets you up to, so instead of using those things twice and creating some of the issues around resistance that we've had uh, in the past, you have another tool in your toolbox to do things you know, in a different way that 
Okay, I, I can keep going. You mean we're not supposed to do what we did before in the past where we spray like a half rate of Roundup to burn down and then come out and do a half rate of Roundup over top of the crop and another half rate and do nothing else and and hope uh, it no judgments. <laughs> uh, that's not why I'm here. That's that's uh, what got uh, us to the weed reasons, yeah, but, yeah. right? But you know, hey, it created harp the opportunity for harp, right? Well, yeah, I mean that's you know, yes. Uh, but you know, following the labels, even if, when it's ours, you know, Mother Nature is pretty dynamic, as we yep. well know. So we're not going to sit here and say no resistance yep. to harp ever. Hey, everything uh, wants to live, so yeah. uh, it's we're it's going to fight it out, and you know. Uh, you know, resistance is going to be a, a challenge for weeds to, sure. to overcome on harp, just given its nature and how it works in that physiological way in so many spots at once. We well, can't say never, but like everything else, you, you want to use right. good guidance, good stewardship, multiple modes of action, uh, and keep that going forward. So those who have the Roundup resistant uh, kochia that you're working on, uh, they created that through, you know, uh, doing fallow chem burn down. Yeah. So guys... If you're listing out in Western Kansas, please don't do that again. All right. I had another thing that popped in my mind while we were talking here. Um, cotton is one of my favorite crops. And uh, I would suppose this has a place as a cotton desiccant too, pre-harvest. Uh, it does. We have formulations that do exactly that. Uh, desiccation, um, whether it's cotton. Uh, we've also done a lot of work in potatoes, um, as well as soybeans in South America. Uh, it's certainly, again, very active ingredients are no different, uh, but it's the ratios uh, and the uh, uh, the way we set up the formulation that makes it, you know, the, the desiccant that we want it to be. Uh, we see wonderful, uh, wonderful uh, activity there, and uh, it's pretty wild to to think about what, you know, replacing, especially some, some of the products that are used like Paraquat and others uh, that, uh, you know, we see banned in other countries. So how do we improve, you know, farmer safety? Uh, is one thing we, we think about as well uh, as just you know offering a, a new and different tool to get the job done. And from my understanding, it is not a translocating agent, correct? It is it is point of contact agent. Correct. So there is an issue now. We're currently in some areas on oats, you know, for example, and wheat in uh, eastern Kansas uh, or in northern Canada, where we're using glyphosate as a desiccant. And even at the late stages, those sugars are, are being deposited into the seed head and we're getting some complexing with the glyphosate molecule and making it into the seed head. So, you know, the whole Quaker Oats, uh, you know, or <laughs> testing for glyphosate. Um, I don't think the nice part is, is we can avoid that issue and still have an effective, uh, safer to use desiccant. Yeah. And that goes back to, you know, again, our, our discussions around right. why, right? Consumers... Right. Consumers are asking different questions. They have access to different information, and they're demanding, you know, uh, an improvement in their food supply system. Uh, it's perfectly logical, and and yeah. So how do we, how do we offer, and how do we invest in our uh, food supply system, like, like we're we're doing to to improve it and offer, you know, what consumers are asking for. Yeah, I, I think it's outstanding. So the uh, team you've put together. Uh, it is pretty, pretty outstanding. You have an all-star team. Um, I noticed Kip Tom and, uh, you know, Dr. Rob Fraley and, and some others I, I recognize and I'm forgetting at this moment, but tell me how you and uh, your partner put this, uh, dream team together. And, and uh, yeah, I, I, I pinch myself on multiple occasions when we sit around our, our board room and, uh, get to talk to folks like Kip, like Rob Fraley, uh, Bill Buckner, who is our CEO, former, uh, head of Bayer Crop Science here in North America, um, Aiden Conley, who led Alltech uh, for a number of years, um, and then most recently Peter Eckes, the former uh, Chief Technology Officer for Bayer, or sorry, for BSF on a global scale, just joined us as our new chairperson uh, this May. Uh, so yeah, dynamic set of leaders. At the same time, we have a wonderful set of people uh, on our staff, on our teams uh, that lay hands on the technology every single day and and I'd say do the do the hard work uh, to 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 bring this product to the marketplace. Uh, but you're absolutely right; it, it is a wonderful set of leaders, and I think it's because they they see the vision, uh, they understand you know the need in the marketplace, and it's something simply to be you know to to be a part of this is quite exciting because we're we're driving change, uh, we're doing something that really hasn't been done before uh, in a unique and dynamic way. 
uh, and we are extremely fortunate to have them uh, on board with us. And getting investment, I mean, the, the, the possibilities are amazing, okay? Getting from start to the possibilities, that's a, that's a white knuckle ride. Uh, what's that? How, how has it been for, for getting uh, funding and such so far on your journey? I think it's the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. Um, it, you know, it's, and, and not, I don't want to over exaggerate. It's challenging. Um, yeah. the, and it's more challenging now than it has ever been, or at least for us in the last couple of years, because of the, just the market dynamics mm -hmm. uh, in ag and just you know the general piece of, of which we, we've raised a, a good amount of money uh, that has sustained us for the last uh, four years. We have uh, a round open now and looking to continue uh, to build on that, uh, but it is challenging. Um, and so I, I think, uh, I don't think it's going to, you know, ease up anytime soon, uh, but we keep going forward and we keep doing what we need to do because of the possibilities. You know, as, as we advance, as we get closer to the market, it probably gets harder and harder, right? Those last 10 yards to cross the goal line there, everything gets a little more compressed, a little more challenging. So you got to get, you got to finish. Uh, you know, the, 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 the only thing, uh, Harder than starting is finishing, and we're we're close to the finish line. Uh, we're going to raise some more capital as as we speak now, uh, and that should get us to where we need to be. One thing we've noticed, I I'm have an opportunity to be part of the Ag Startup Engine out at Iowa State, and uh, there's a quite a few funds out there for the startup phase or the seed money phase, and there's there's probably some for the you know first round, but in a business like yours where you take a, a large amount of time. To, to get there. And it takes a lot of uh, team members and technology to make that happen. There's a kind of a gap in agriculture uh, of VC funding specific for, for ag tech to get you those, those bigger, bigger checks. Um, do you see that? Uh, that's kind of what we're seeing and we're putting together a larger follow on fund because of that. Are you having troubles uh, in that arena? Not just because uh, would... of interest rates or the general economy is a little down, but I'm just saying on a, not just the last two years, but on the last 10 year scale. I think you're exactly right. Um, we do see that gap and that has been a challenge and continues to be a challenge. We we hear, oh, you're too early. Oh, and you're not late enough. I, mean, I just go back and forth. Um, and so it's you know, incredibly important to uh, find the right partners to support uh, from a financial standpoint. But there is that gap in the marketplace for I want to see a turnaround in three years, just to pick a number. Well, it doesn't take that long to produce a uh, technology like this. It takes longer. You know, from a, uh, from a uh, synthetic side, any of the big crop protection companies, it takes 10 years and $300 million to bring one of those products to the marketplace. It, it's not going to take us that much time and not nearly uh, that expense, given what we're working with. Um, but cash flow is incredibly important, and it, it is challenging in kind of that, that middle zone um, so we, we're finding ways we're going to have to break through to the other side. 25B products going to get a point of sale across, uh, and that should change the, the dynamics of who we are. Proof of concept, and then that yep. makes things a lot better. And that'll open you up to more than the ag-related funding. Sure. Um, where is that zone of of mystery? You know, the fifty thousand dollar checks and and up to two fifty. That seems to be pretty pretty fluid out there. Uh, what is it? The one to five million checks is where it's kind of the toughest to get. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. then north five and five and up is actually easier than one to five. If I'm yeah, counterintuitively market. Yeah, counterintuitively, uh, it is easier, but it's also expensive. Um, oh yes, because of all of the <laughs> proof that you have to provide and, and such. Well, not not just that, but if you're getting a ten million dollar check, there's obviously an exchange for the equity, and you know. What your valuation is and those types of things so yeah. there's it becomes expensive capital right you'd, you'd like to need it. more than one percent left yeah right exactly. <laughs> yes um yeah. but you absolutely need those partners and, and yeah. that's why the, the market is set up the way it is but uh, you, you work with the right people and, and make sure you have the right folks sitting around the table with you to support you when the times get tough mm -hmm. uh, and you keep going you need to talk to some of those guys out in western kansas with the kosha and a lot of pay for ground, they'd probably gladly write you the one to $5 million checks just to have something control at Kosha. <laughs> well, let's, let's talk separately. After this. <laughs> you, you want their numbers. I got you. Yes. 
All right. Um, but no, it's amazing how you've, you've, um, put this all together, uh, d- describe the experience. I mean, to leave a, a, a big chem company and, 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 you know, you're, you're really on the, the big aircraft carrier, right. And you, and you fall off into, uh, you know, you're, you're fighting a war in a Kodiak boat. Uh, I mean, that's, uh, it's kind of the equivalent, isn't it? When you, when you're starting out, I mean, what's, what's that felt like? Yeah, I mean, it's it's a leap of faith, obviously. Um, but I, and I think you were being kind what kind of boat we were starting out with. It felt more like we had a couple of uh, life preservers and we we're just floating along. But <laughs> but it's exactly that. It's, hey, you, you've got to believe you have to have the understanding of what, what you're getting into because it is going to be a bumpy roller coaster ride. And it still is, you know, that the ups and downs come, you know, sometimes hourly, depending on how the day is going. Uh, but that's the reality of, of what we're signing up for. There are no guarantees in this. Um, you know, it, I'd spent 15 years at the previous company uh, building up knowledge, skill sets, understandings uh, to be able to try and do this. Um, the vast majority of the startups, as we know, fail for you know range of reasons, most of which is running out of capital. Um, but again, you go, go into it eyes wide open um, and believe and understand what you have in your hands, you you can get it done. But it is it has been tumultuous, uh, but at the same time, uh, as hard as it's been, as uh, challenging it's been at times, um, nothing more rewarding than seeing the in- incremental steps. And at some point you take a look back and say, well, we were once there. Look where we've gotten to. We've got more to go, but it is, you know, it is wild to think about where we've been able to get to what we've achieved uh and now we got to finish it out would you say you're about 80 percent there uh somewhere 80 85 yeah we're close um we're you know we've got really well functioning products from a development standpoint it's now all about formulation uh we have incredibly active incredible active ingredients uh they work incredibly well it's now how do we improve those formulations for functionality uh, to get us down to the right amount of AI that makes the cost of goods where we need it to be. And we're just about there. We're, we're working through a number of pieces, uh, one of which is encapsulation of the products. We're working uh, uh, with a company called Agrispheres right now. Uh, they have a fully natural, already OMRI certified, EPA certified uh, product uh, to encapsulate it, uh, both pre and post-emergent. And so it's steps like that that will allow you allow us uh, to get closer to the marketplace with a really high functioning product. So I've asked one question that almost every farmer is screaming at the radio in their truck right now. When and Monty, why have you not asked this? When? Yeah, that's right. When can I get this? Yeah, it, we're close. Uh, we're looking at probably another year. I mean, we've got to make sure because we get one shot. Um, you know, from a business perspective, you you have a single opportunity to, um, once it gets in a grower's hands, it's got to work. Uh, it's got to work well, and it's got to work well enough for two things. One, they're going to buy it again, and they're going to tell their friends. Um, that's for any product you're bringing to the marketplace. It's got to, it's got to perform the way it needs to uh, so that uh, the, the experience is there. Um, you know, we're, we're getting closer and closer each day, and I, I'd say about a year or so. Uh, till those first 25B products get into the marketplace. We're looking to uh, submit registration early next year as well uh, for the next set of formulations that come behind it. Okay, so you're possible 25 or are you looking at a crop year 26? Yeah, probably crop year 26. Okay. If all, if all goes according to plan, which, you know, there's always uh, a there's give and always, take on best plans. So There's always stuff, yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, as Devin, much as we know, there's things we don't. Other than, uh, exactly, it's uh, unknowns that get you. The um, uh, Other than YouTube and those kind of things, is there actual demonstration sites planned or or in where people can can see uh, the product efficacy? Uh, we work with a series of CROs across uh, the country and uh, other geographies as well. Um, we haven't done uh, truly any wide open, if you will, invitation. Sure. Uh, it's something we're talking about doing uh, media events and those kind of things to kind of, kind of, as we've advanced the products to get, you know, more and more, I will call it believability in, in terms of what we're working on. 
Uh, so more to come on that. Don't have a, a great answer today in terms of uh, inviting a series of farmers down, but uh, you know, uh, that is uh, something we, we will need to do uh, as we get uh, closer to the market. Yeah, yeah. So to to learn more and, and do that, I've been on your website. It's really handy. Uh, harpbio.com, correct? H-A-R-P-E. Yep. Uh, bio.com. And just a fun little story why you chose the name harp. It's uh, you're not it's not the harp that you're that you're playing and is sound soothing and such. Uh, no, this is this is a brutal thing. I mean, you know, uh, farmers don't like weeds and they're going to really appreciate you hearing where harp came from. Yeah, we don't appreciate weeds either. Uh, yeah, it's harp with an E. The E is silent. Um, and this uh, comes from uh, my partner, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Bromer. Uh, again, incredibly talented scientist. He's also uh, fluent in Latin, as, as we all should be. Uh, but uh, he uh, he came up with the name because uh, harp is the sword that Perseus used to cut off the head of Medusa. So we Ouch. think about Medusa uh, as a pigweed and all the uh, parts and pieces uh, dangling off and taking the head off. Uh, it really uh, is nice uh, nice play on words uh, and symbolic of what we're trying to achieve. <laughs> pretty funny our medusa head i kind of think of, of her as some of that kosha rolling across kansas so uh, <laughs> so interesting um oh great conversation what else should we have uh, visited about daniel we had time to hear together today um you know i think we're you know no product is perfect but i do think we have several spots in the marketplace where we're going to make a difference uh again giving tools to growers today like those organic growers that don't have uh, those parts and pieces um, that they need to to really get the the weed control that they're after. Uh, home and garden, uh, you know, if you're a homeowner looking for something different, this is going to fill that that need for you. Um, and then for the conventional acre grower that's challenged by weed resistance, it's going to be something that used in combination, so you can continue to use and rely upon your your trusted uh, management programs, just enhanced by nature. Uh, and so it really is a, a unique approach that we're taking so we can fit uh, into those different marketplaces and, and support growers because that, that really is, uh, you know, our mission more than anything else. It's We're doing this because we understand the importance uh, of what growers bring uh, to us. You know, everybody needs, wants to eat, and that's, uh, you know, the, the, the uh, food, fuel, fiber uh, that growers produce is, is absolutely the reason why uh, we're doing what we're doing. Well, I appreciate uh, all the work that you and your uh, entire team, and but you and your co-founder to to have the idea, to explore it, to take the risk, you know, jump off the ship and uh, burn burn the ships and and stay mm -hmm. and and make it happen. It's it's certainly been a wild ride. When when did you start officially? Uh, officially incorporated in twenty twenty. Okay, so, it's been, so uh, just really pretty years. short duration. Yeah. Yeah. So congratulations on tremendous success in a, in a short period of time that that's hard to pull off. No, I appreciate it. Thank you. So no, look forward to uh, seeing how this can be a, a great tool in the farmer's toolbox. I think it's going to allow to be used in a system uh, that's going to allow us to use less tillage to allow to be more diverse in the crop rotations, uh, allow us to, um, you know, control resistant weeds. Uh, I think, it, it really matches uh, soil health principles and what we're trying to do do there. So I, I thank you for guys for creating that. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Thanks for listening. That is some exciting work being done by HARP to, as they say, harness nature's unique combination of ingredients. You know, the Aggie Merch podcast is committed to bringing you this kind of new and exciting work that's helping us advance those soil health opportunities. So if you'd like to learn more about what we're doing to help growers implement effective soil health practices, check out our website at asn.farm and there you can click on links to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, and YouTube. There's a lot of great things happening and all Always something to learn. Thanks for listening.